I think a couple of people are still outside uh, chatting and, and, and gossiping. Um, I would like to present you to uh, Philipp Schaumann. I looked it up in, in your profile. Um, you are Krimi-Autor Mark Ellsberg. So, uh, I saw it. Krimi-Autor Mark Ellsberg. Yeah, he has wrote, uh, written some technical books. One is called Blackout. Uh, that's a, about two weeks in Europe, uh -huh. no power, no electricity, uh -huh. and everything breaks down, and lots of dead people, and lots of things. And, and then okay. there's another book, Zero, which is about um, Facebook and everything gone wild, and also lots of dead people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so normally we don't do any marketing or advertising, so I won't uh, mention the name again. It's uh, Krimi-Autor Mark Ellsberg, MR. Uh, M A R C Ellsberg, Don't, but forget it because I didn't mention it because we are absolutely um, marketing free zone here, so that's a absolutely no no with us. Um, so okay, uh, Philip, the floor is yours. Yes, um, I'm like to talk about something a lot less technical. I'm talking about philosophy, and the topic that I'm discussing it is ethics, uh, the ethics of autonomous systems. In other words, ethics of AI. Uh, object and um, yeah I'm a physicist when I was young there was no um, there was uh, there, uh, informatics had not yet been invented I used computers but we used to call it EDV Elektronische Datenverarbeitung um, and I worked with mainframes I'm mainly representing Sicherheitskultur dot uh, AT um, that's my website. It's a huge website. I'm working for a bank, but this has nothing to do with the bank. We, luckily, we don't have autonomous systems yet, but we are getting there, and I'm a little frightened about that. Um, what I want to talk about is moral hazards, and uh, of, I was approached, will we, hear, will we hear about the trolley problem? Yes, we will hear about the trolley problem. Who has heard about the trolley problem? Oh, at least half. Wonderful. Okay, um, the trolley problem is the, the following point. Uh, it's a thought experiment that has been done since 1967 with thousands of people all over the world in all cultures um, in universities. And it's, it's a stupid idea, but it's the following. There's a line and there's a trolley here. And that, uh, the line is, um, is going down this way and this trolley somehow has started to move and it's moving down that line and here are five people and this trolley will kill them but there is a switch there and you are in control of that switch and on that line there's only a single person so the question very simple is do you change that switch or or do you leave the switch like it is and um Everybody can have a short thought about this. Um, the problem is, uh, has been handled many, many times and discussed, and it's about 50-50. Um, the thing is, if you don't do anything, it's, it's five dead, and if you, uh, if you do something, it's one dead, but you killed that person. So it's a question whether you kill, um, or whether um, you allow five people to be killed. Both things are not really nice, but um, this is a decision. And it, and it has been many, uh, it has been done many times, and um, the rational solution is um, that, of, of course, you go for one dead. It's a rational approach, because five is bigger than one. Very simple. But on the other hand, um, there's a rule, thou shalt not kill, and it's about half and half of the population, depending a little bit. But typically it's about half and half uh, who decide for one or the other. Um, there is a very interesting discussion about this in Wikipedia. Uh, in the English one, it's just a general problem. And the German one is very, very big, and it discusses the judi judicial uh, topics about all these things. And this is much bigger than the English one, of course, because lawyers are... <laughs> yes. 
Lawyers are lawyers. Um, and then there are hundreds of variations, but I only showed two variations. This one is the fat man problem, and it was in 76 when it was introduced. Uh, now there's only one line, and this thing is running down, and here's a very fat man, and you are standing behind that fat man, and that fat man is leaning over over some bridge or something, and you have the chance, you, you just need to push him. <laughs> and he falls down, and he stops that thing, and the number of people who now decide to save those five is going down. Because pulling a switch is much, much easier than actually kicking that one and pushing him <laughs> and manually killing that person. But the mathematics are still the same, right? It's still five to one. Um, so, it, it's the same problem and you have the same conflict. Um, now, this, is, this sounds very theoretical. And then came 9-11. And in 9-11, uh, um, 300 people were in the plane and 3,000 people were in the building. And in, in the German parliament, there was a discussion. If we have that case, for instance, going against a football stadium, then we have 500,000 or something. If we have, um, for, the, or for the Euro uh, event, if we have a case that an airplane is um, captured and it's flying towards Paris. Shall we shoot it down or not? And that's a trolley problem. <coughs> and the German parliament has decided um, we shoot it down. It's real life, real life trolley problem, we have that. In Austria, uh, we don't have that problem. We wouldn't know how to shoot that thing down, but that's a different... <laughs> But that's a, that's a different solution. The other thing that is always discussed with the trolley problem is the ticking time bomb scenario. It's about torture. Um, there is, in, a, in the James Bond movie, there is an, uh, a nuclear device and there's only, uh, and it's ticking, and uh, um, the, there's, of course there's a code to disarm it, and this person knows the code, and can, are you allowed to torture him to death? Uh, in order to prevent this nuclear uh, device from exploding, and that's the same. That's the same problem, basically. Um, and the, the theoretical background here is that uh, um, we have two ethical context um, concepts that are standing against each other. Uh, one is um, in, in German called Principienethik, based on principles. Um, the en English is deontology but you might not have heard it, uh, and I had not heard it uh, b before. So, um, in, in this Principian Edict, you do something because it's defined that you should do or you shall not do. This is, you thou shall not kill. It's Principian Edict. Then there's Utilitarismus, and that's something for the techies like us. Um, you build the sum of the, uh, of the, uh, of the well-being of all people involved, and then at that point, five is bigger than one, so um, saving five is better than one. So implementing the trolley problem, um, you either decide for, for the Principian ethic approach or you decide for utilitarism. Uh, utili utilitarism would save the five people. So, and, and the German parliament went for utilitarism. And um, yes, um, there's another case, there's an Austrian case, um, because the trolley problem is actually much more often encountered than one would think. Um, in 2005, Austria decided that you need to have light on the car in daylight, because it saves life. You actually kill less people. And um, there were arguments that it needs more energy and, and those light bulbs uh, go off. And then, very strange, 2008, this requirement was removed. Isn't that funny? And there was no real discussion about why that should, why that is removed. And um, you can try to research it and there is something here. 
and um, there is an evaluation, and it's not very clear, and they don't talk a lot about those. Um, wasn't, there, wasn't there actually statistical analysis of the number of people who were actually infected by the virus? Difference. Measurements? Yeah, weren't there um, new measurements that were not available before 2005 and were only available afterwards because they could actually measure that the, the number of deaths didn't, weren't decreased? Um, they, what I have read and, um, and I am citing that study is there were actually reduction in, in people, 18 less dead and uh, uh, a lot of less accidents. So yes, this thing worked. It reduced the number of people. And um, actually, then if you go into the mathematics ab about how much more uh, gas you need and all these kind of things, it works. Um, the, there's a saving for each of the, um, of the drivers of 47 euro per year. So it works out. However, now the problem. Um, Less people are killed, but different people are killed. Uh, the number of uh, pedestrians and children um, deaths goes up, and the motorcycle driver have a disadvantage because n uh, before that thing, a motorcycle were the only one who, tri who drove with light on, so you could see a motorcycle. Now everybody has a light on, so the motorcycle people are no longer so easy to see. So you actually get 18 less dead, but different ones. And so the decision is left to each of you, uh, whether you prefer to kill, uh, <laughs> and so on. It's, <laughs> it's a little ugly. Uh, and that's, I guess that's why it's not discussed in Parliament very open. I think that was a closed session when they discussed this thing. It's a little, yes. Um, there are some more statistics. Um, now. Now we switch to the, to the robots, and you can't talk about robots without talking about Asimov. We had that discussion before. So um, Asimov in 42, long before anybody here was around, I guess, um, came up with, um, with a book, iRobot, and he um, attacked the problem of ethics for robots. And that was very theoretical at that point, and uh, what I'm po pointing out is now we have that case, actually. So his, um, this is one example of, of a solution that everybody understands, that is very clean, and very uh, everybody agrees with it, and it's wrong. So um, rule number one, a robot um, cannot hurt a person and cannot allow a person to be hurt, period. Um, rule number two, a robot must follow instruction unless uh, there's a violation of law one. And, th and the next one is the robot must um, preserve his own existence unless there is a conflict with law number two or law number one. And it's very simple and it's very clear. And Asimov spends the rest of his writing career to show that this doesn't work. <laughs> because. It's so nice, he, he, in each of the new books he had more counter examples why this thing doesn't work. Um, and there are many different things and again, it's, Wikipedia is full of it. Um, so if we look at this kind of things, um, I teach this thing at, the, uh, at some Fachhochschulen and then we go through the thing and anybody must find out what's actually wrong. But one of the first things, of course, is how to recognize a human. Uh, Anybody who has seen Blade Runner um, knows that there's another big book and another big movie about how to recognize a human if the robot is very, very well done. And we will reach that point where you, you can't. And robots, uh, we heard AI, um, in, the, in the first speech, we heard about emotional response in AI. The Blade Runner robots ha have programmed in um, emotional response and they show empathy and if you frighten them uh, they show reactions in the pupils and everything so no this is really a problem how, how to recognize a human then what is hurting people emotional hurt well anybody who has been in a relationship know knows how easy that one is <laughs> so 
how do we expect a robot to determine whether you will be emotionally hurt? You don't know it with your partner, how, how, to, know, uh, how to avoid that problem. So for a robot, that's really one. Um, and the, the other one is instructions of humans. Any human? How old? Three-year-old? Two-year-old? People in psychiatric asylums can, shall give instructions to robots? Wow. There are some people I, I don't like to be able to instruct robots, even if they can't, uh, can't instruct a robot to, um, to kill somebody else, but uh, they can do nasty things, especially if the robot doesn't recognize how that this actually hurts, what's, what's happening there. And then the other thing is inactivity, not allow through inactivity um, to uh, that a human gets hurt. There was in long before most of your time there was Raumpatrouille Orion and there was one there was one story where they came upon upon a planet and in that planet the robots had actually um, taken over the planet because the humans didn't stop with the wars and wars killed people so uh, the robots took over like in Matrix and it's according to the law so that is, um, it's a little complicated, um, these kind of things. Now, um, this was theory, and in 2005, um, we now have robots, and they are interacting with us, and they are interacting very directly with us, not just in the factory, but in, if you are in California, they, you can have very impacting uh, interactions with robots, and um, you can call them social robots because social because they interact with the person uh, and they interact by acting with uh, driving a car and interfering with your driving that's social interaction uh, i hope they are not emotional yet <laughs> because then that would be really frightening if those cars get angry at you um, <laughs> but as it is right now i think it's dangerous enough and, uh, well, th they could be defensive. In the beginning, the Google cars were very defensive. They were not able to cross um, something uh, that is very American, four-way cross, where uh, you just negotiate b by looking at the others who is going to drive. The car was standing there in, uh, in rush hour for hours because <laughs> it couldn't negotiate <laughs> with the humans. And they changed it, actually. They changed the algorithm to be less defensive. Now, a result was they now had the first accident where the Google, after, after many accidents, where always the humans were, um, were the cause, they had the first one where, um, the, uh, where the robot was the guilty one. Um, he was driving on a um, on the right side of, of the road and there, there was some blockage on the road and the a bus coming from behind and the computer calculated that bus has no problem stopping but there's a lack of psycho psychological understanding of bus drivers <laughs> <laughs> of course he didn't <laughs> he was he he was in the right so <laughs> he just went through and and actually it's considered the fault of, um, of the Google car, and it's the first one that is uh, actually um, where the Google car is uh, the problem. In the other cars, um, the humans were the guilty ones. However, <laughs> the humans say this thing was driving so terribly defensive that <laughs> it's, it was hard not to hit it. Uh, so. Um, there is lots of literature, and you get all these kind of things, and you can read uh, all of that. Um, now, the Google car is, this is a picture from a YouTube video, and I find it very, very impressive. This is the car, and this is how the car sees the environment. And um, it can, with radar, it can look around these kind of things. Here you see what, what a human driver is seeing. You can't really see those cars. But here you, you can see all the cars, and it's not just that this thing sees the cars, it sees the, um, 
the vector, the motion vector. And it, and it does um, the first derivation and the second derivation, and then it knows how those things will behave. Okay, and uh, the thing even sees um, a bicycle driver there. So those things can do magic. I guess in, in the future they will do less accidents. Um, the, pro uh, the problem is uh, it will be different people who die. It's the same thing with driving with light. It will, it will recognize all the other cars. It might have problems with pedestrians and children. So um, the ethical question is um, how to handle this kind of thing. Uh, there are statistics uh, and you can read those things. At the moment it's open. It's not yet clear whether those cars are really better. So, some questions, actually, that come from Asimov. The instructions from the owner, is it more important than other people? Is the life of the, uh, uh, of the owner of the car more important? Or if there is a decision that one must die, that the owner is equal uh, to a, ch a child in the road? The other thing is that um, there is no thing this will hurt. There is a probability that somebody will be hurt. There's always probability. So there might be possible, um, possibly bodily injury. And if, the, if there's a possible bodily injury of the, uh, of the owner, because he didn't use the seat belt. So shall the car break? Can the car break if it knows it will hurt the owner? If you are the owner, well. Um, so these are interesting questions. Comparing um, the uh, bodily injury against a huge, uh, or a possible minor bodily injury to, against a huge damage. And then there are these scenarios that are now actively discussed. And this is the scenario. Um, the car recognizes a ball uh, um, running into the... Um, tumbling into the road, and then a child comes behind and the, the child um, falls down. And the car can't stop, but um, the car could drive against a wall, killing the driver. So, what to do? Um, from a utilitarism, utilitarism standpoint, um, the, the, the driver is older, so the kid has more years to live. It should kill the driver, oh, isn't it? Um, there's another scenario, um, and it's, it's, it's a bus full of school children, or oh, the driver. And these things are discussed, and um, it's many scenarios, and so things now are a little theoretical. Um, an interesting side is, aspect is, at the moment, everybody assumes that everybody is nice to each other in the car, uh, in, in traffic. This is not always happening. But let's go on to some other things, ignoring the road range. Um, the, uh, at the moment, the driver is always responsible. In this case, who should be responsible? Interesting question. Um, and I come to... to um, to some statistics. Right. This is um, robohub.org and uh, they did a poll what should happen in these kind of things. And they asked uh, which of the scenarios. And these are the results. And um, this is 64% go straight kill the child because I'm the owner. And there were 36% saying no. Well, uh, I will not kill a child. Um, it's not your decision. Uh, the question is whose decision should it be, actually? And that is the uh, big question, whose de decision should it be? That's the other problem. In, in a tunnel, there is a school bus. And here, there was a question, who should make that, who should program the firmware of the car? So, and they say, 44% um, said, I'd like to have a setup option when I go into the car. I'm willing to die for so many kids or, or something like that. Um, this is Google should design and then there were some other ideas and 33% which, which make actually some sense say 
uh, there should be a law saying that uh, these cars should be programmed in, o in order to do those things. Now, for each of you who is a little technical, there is a business opportunity. Um, if the cars are programmed by law, uh, you can hack it, right? That's easy. Um, those cars get patched, and in that patch you can put something in. Uh, digital signatures, yes. I guess, uh, I'm sure that all those cars have digital design firmware. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, that's one of the IoT things. This is just another one of the IoT things. So, um, then an idea that actually the author, uh, Mark Elsberg, came up with is um, it should be like now. It's just random, whether you are able to break or not break. Let's put a random number, pseudo-random number generator there and, and say that, well, in, in so many percent I will die and in so many... This is like real life. But the thing is, at the moment, um, at the moment it's just chance. And, and uh, if, if you come before a judge, you say, I didn't have time to react. The programmer cannot say, I didn't have time to react. The programmer needs to solve that problem now. And Google is actually aware of those kind of things. And these are the Google rules. Avoiding hitting pedestrians and bicycles, avoiding contact with other cars, and avoiding contact with fixed objects. This is rule number one, two, three. So they are aware, they have a big, they have a big ethics board and they discuss these kind of things. And that's big, that's coming up and we will have those things on the road pretty soon. Even here, everybody is, is running around and every politician, politician says we need these kind of things on the open roads and the truck drivers will be the first one to be replaced on the autobahns, uh, this is the easy solution to do, um, and so on and so on. We will get those things pretty soon, and then we will have lots of options to implement the trolley problem. And that's, everybody knows Ray Kurzweil. He, Kurzweil, he's a little strange, I think, but what really frightens me is that he is the research boss of Google. So he has a little bit of influence, <laughs> being somewhat strange. <laughs> Okay, that's it. Um, thank you very much. Well, I guess there will be heaps of questions. So I'll just start on the right. Thank you. Really cool talk. Something that has been discussed also among uh, my uh, friends and fellows in this industry for a long time. I think one component should be mentioned as well, which is that there is also a societal question, because if the car drives into the wall and nobody's supposed to die when they run on the street, I would never drive past the school anymore in my whole life, because if they know <laughs> that they can just run among the cars and they will not hit anyone, they will always decide, you know, against uh, uh, hurting anyone, then this concept will, will completely be flawed because it will be hacked right away by anybody who wants to cross the street. And uh, if so you know they that have to kill in a way because otherwise, yeah. yeah. If you know that, this, that those cars will always break, who needs, who needs traffic lights as pedestrians? You just And you can kill somebody just by running in the street and it will be the programmer's fault. It's crazy. No, uh, but <laughs> the other thing is also, I think they aren't allowed to go faster than 50 miles per hour at the moment. In, the, in, in street areas, yeah. so I guess they can quite confidently go into a wall now, as it is, right? If they stay at this pace, like with the current algorithm, the first thing without that, killing you, you. The know? first instances that we will see in Europe are the trucks on the Autobahn, and they go 100, period, at least 100. They will go, probably they will go exactly 100. And there's a lot of pressure to get those truck trains implemented where mm. they all drive behind each other, a long chain of trucks, and that saves a lot of energy and, and it's wonderful. It's wonderful, but we will get less, those things. Less ball games there though, right? Yeah. So. We will get those things on the road pretty soon. There's lots of pressure to do those kind of things. Um, is there any, um, the decision of the German court for utilitarianism, um, was there, when they worded their decision, 
any little um, extra paragraph in which they um, also said, but also when this situation comes along, each individual is required to um, employ some creativity <laughs> to maybe, um, well, n not kill the fat man, but just have him, you know, just break the train anyway in some way. So, um, for example, when all these jobs now are lost because the tr um, truck drivers are not going to be employed anymore. Um, on the other hand, we, uh, this is bad, right? But on the other hand, um, we, we might, due to all of this new technology, find new jobs. And I don't think so, so but... No, no, I mean, th 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 this is an open question. Yes, that it's, it's not clear. Um, I mean, we, we will lose so many jobs, and there will also be a, a great many new jobs. I mean, at least... So, my, my question is, um, is there some, in, in this um, ethics uh, forum, so to speak, also some formulation of um, the need or um, the definition of some sort of creativity? No. Creativity is... I never came across the discussion of creativity in any of those things. I'm reading a lot of those things. Uh, no, actually, no. Um, just a follow-up up of, of, of his question. Yes, because I think if um, you describe a, a problem to a situation that's now, that's, that's, that is it now, I believe or is hope um, that we will adapt. So we will change probably the, the physical, no. physical layout of, of streets so that it doesn't can happen and so on. So I think mankind is, will adapt to this kind of changes. No? I think yes, and um, when we are at that point where there are only aut autonomous cars, uh, we, will, we, we won't have the problems anymore. The problem is the time until we get there. Uh, you, if you have fully automatic road and there are cables in the road and everything, uh, this is solved. The interim time will be a big problem, I think, and it will be very interesting, and we need law changes. Uh, at the moment, it's totally open. Um, there is a discussion about who is guilty um, in the German parliament and the uh, uh, Ministry of Justice and the Ministry of Traffic, something, and they are totally opposite, totally opposite position. It's totally open at the moment, and they are fighting openly uh, about uh, who has, uh, who is guilty. Yes. I think the whole uh, discussion is highly controversial, so the very f last and final question then. Maybe one aspect I think that um, maybe didn't come out of this discussion uh, is the question of how much confi confidence we can have actually have in the, in the judgments. Of because the in, the, in <laughs> both in the, yeah, about both of AI and also of ourselves, of course. Because people also make mistakes and our neural networks are pretty much more deep and more big than any neural network or whatever you use uh, for, for implementing these cars. Even if they have uh, a great overview uh, uh, over the street, but I, I really don't think they can make the perfect decision and the perfect judgment about the situation at all points. So. I'm not sure. The car needs to make a decision. It needs yes, to sure, go sure. that way or that sure. way. The car but has the trolley problem. But it's, it, but it's even harder than... You can't, the, you can't not make a decision. No, no, I, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say uh, you... But it's another variable you, you probably should consider because if you know everything, you can always decide it's utilitarian. But I, I think um, the... the principle-based uh, ethics is also a consequence of our ability uh, or, or, or of our inability to um, always consider all the consequences. I think your example with the driving, with the lights on uh, driving rules, uh, laws, was a, a pretty good example because you have to really read a lot of statistics in order to make any judgment 
uh, on this topic. So this is clearly something where, without reading lots of studies, you cannot say anything. And also, I think, yeah, you, you, we will have this problem also with the robots, and the robots will have the problem. So, <laughs> uh, <yeah>. um, <clears throat> I think this is a never-ending story. But I think the, the, even the, the scientific research is still, the eth ethical research is still going on in this whole topic. And I think there will be quite a lot of very challenging topics coming on. Um, I just read an article about the, the, the super um, viruses that, that there are no um, uh, medical um, treatments uh, against. Uh, it's actually bacteria. So super bacteria that are not uh, being able to be um, um, killed by any kind of antibiotics uh, that we have anymore. So I think this whole topic is, uh, is highly controversial. I think it was really, really interesting talk. So very thank you again, Philip.